Welcome back to the State of the Second Podcast. We are here with Ari from uh, Primary Weapon Systems and Lone Wolf. Yes. Ari, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you uh, again. Uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Tell us a little about yourself, your sure. backstory, and then we'll dive in deeper. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, I've always kind of had a knack for business, and uh, a lot of people don't really know how or where I got that understanding for business. And um, you know, something I, I was actually really sheepish, uh, sheepish to share uh, for a long time was, you know, I, I came up very non-traditional. Um, you know, I, I dropped out of high school at 16 years old. Um, I never completed high school or college um, because there was a need uh, for me to help uh, my family. Um, my stepfather had left us and I, my mother had uh, breast cancer. So um, I, I helped with the business for a little bit. And, uh, you know, for the longest, as a 16, 17 year old, watching my friends go hang out and, and all that, you know, I kind of hit it. It was shameful in a way. So, but in all that time, I was like, you know, why is this happening to me? You know, I'm never going to have a life after this. But, you know, I had this immediate need to serve my family. So, you know, I did that for three or four years. Um, was able to rebound the business, um, able to sell the business and help my mom, you know, retire. So it was very unconventional way of learning the, uh, the business. It was very retail level. Um, I think that's when I started learning about e-commerce. I, I started a uh, website on GeoCities and I started promoting my business. Um, I started putting uh, the signage outside and people were actually, you know, um, contacting me. Um, because, you know, it, it was in a pretty good location downtown, um, you know, but back then I didn't have a point of sale. So it was like merely, hey, email me, I'll email you back. You send me a check. I'll, you know, I started posting pictures of, of, of our products. And, and so my family business was, you know, imported goods from the Philippines. Uh, we would go back home and we would basically fill a container full of sun dries, you know, whether it be um, clothing or, you know, car wood carvings. Um, my biggest product was actually a garden gnomes. So, you know, it was one thing that it was kind of wacky, right? Um, I do remember at a very young, early age and um, walking around downtown Seattle with uh, bags full of, you know, um, garden gnomes, <laughs> incense and all these random things. And I would, uh, I was trying to talk with businesses to see if they would buy, you know, items for me. Um, and then one thing led to another. Um, I learned how to, you know, uh, work with the different businesses and, you know, the hardest thing was just trying to make rent. Right. And let alone have enough money, you know, to live and survive. And again, this was something that I didn't really share because it was just so shameful. There were times I remember walking around and I would see friends and I would try to hide, you know, cause I was like, people were like, what happened to you? Where, you know, where'd you go? I, I would always lie, you know. Um, but after that, I went back into a community college program, um, you know, trying to learn something because I, I, I needed to desperately recover. Um, you know, all my friends were excelling. They were going to college. Um, I had nothing. So um, my teacher had, um, his, he was so impressed with me. Um, he's like, he knew, he learned my story. And I opened up to him. Um, his wife um, hired me. She was a um uh, technology, you know, telecommunications company. And uh, I ended up, you know, I remember my first three weeks there, I was like, I can't do this. Like, I'm not smart enough for this. There's all these incredible people that are working there. Um, I really wanted to quit. I really want to say, hey, guys, I'm I'm lying. I don't I don't know what I'm doing. But again, that perseverance in me when I was that I learned when I was younger came out and I, I ended up making a decent career out of it. Um, I spent 11 years in the in that field. Um, at the end of it, I became a senior uh, business development manager uh, in technology. Uh, I would lead teams of engineers uh, to build databases for accounting. Um, and that's when I started to, to make a little money. Um, I met my wife very young. Um, you know, in fact, uh, after the first two or three weeks, we moved in to get uh, with each other. And everyone's like, you're crazy. But I was always the type of person where I always could make that decision really quickly. And I just knew I was like, all right, you guys can doubt me. And, uh, you know, we have been together now for 23 years. Uh, we have three beautiful children, um, and a fairly normal life. 
Um, but anyhow, so from, from there, um, I fell in love with shooting sports. Um, a friend of mine that was a fishing friend of mine said, hey, you got to try this game called uh, IDPA. So I was like, all right, cool. Um, he finally got me to come out there, instantly fell in love. Um, I, you know, after that was shooting every weekend. I got involved with my club. Um, you know, I think my first year I won a state championship in that. Um, and then uh, year two, I became the club president. Um, started running clubs out of Renton Fishing Game Club. Um, I was the safety officer. Um, after my tenure there, I became a shooter's rep. You know, um, I was very heavily involved in the sport. I would always get there early, help every club set up, stay late, break everything down, help with the scorers, help with everything else, sit on the council board and represent the shooting sports. Um, I fell in love with it so much that I wanted to get into the business. Um, and then, I, at, you know, at that point in my life, after, you know, the 12 years at that telecommunications company, I, I was making pretty good money, right? I was, I was making almost six figures. Um, and then I was on forums online. I was like, you know, looking up how to get into the industry, but I had no experience. So um, I met a man uh, named John Huang. Uh, he had a rifle shop out in Auburn, Washington uh, called Rainier Arms. Um, and he hired me at $10 an hour. Um, you know, I, I started very humbly. I, I would clean toilets. I would, you know, clean the counters. Um, I remember the first couple of weeks he was, he asked me, you know, why are you staying until nine? I said, well, I'm restocking the shelves and I'm answering some emails. And, you know, I never asked me to do that, but as a former business owner, I just knew that that's what had to be done. Um, a few weeks later, he got a response from a customer that said, Hey, thank you very much for answering my email at midnight. He goes, really? And he looked on the email and it was like, it was me. Um, I took initiative because that's what I learned early on. And I, you know, I knew that was important for the business. And I think from there, he kind of, you know, said, uh, all right, this guy kind of has it. He started opening up and allowing me to do different parts of the business. Um, I was a gunsmith for a little while. I worked the counter, I answered emails, um, all the while on the end of a printer uh, table uh, in this very tiny room. Right. And there's like three of us in there. Uh, this is the very early years of Rainier Arms, um, you know, and I, I, I wanted to just be more a part of that business because I learned, you know, early on, like, I'm, I'm going to learn. I'm going to try to figure this out. I, I got heavily involved with product design and understanding, you know, the things that made people want to buy these products. And I started uh, becoming his buyer. I started, I think the first company I helped bring on was Nighthawk Customs. Uh, back then, Rainier Arms was just a rifle company. So he was like, oh, I don't know about pistols. Um, you know, John was always pretty hesitant about it. We wanted to maintain a high level. So he's like, all right, if you're going to bring in pistols, Ari, I want something really nice. So um, I used to shoot uh, with this guy named Rob Potter. Um, yeah, in, in IDPA. And uh, I was very proud that I was able to get, you know, product in there. And next thing you know, I'm like searching online on, on, on Instagram looking for just hot new products. Um, I went to my first, um, you know, shot show and, you know, I, di I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to do. Um, I'm just this, this, this kid, right. You know, um, I think back then I was like 31, 32. Um, and no one knows me from Adam. You know, I was just very persistent trying to get in front of people. Most of the time people are like trying to shoot me off or didn't have the time to talk with me. Um, but I started working with more and more companies. Um, I, I chose companies, that were up and coming. I think, you know, that, that was John's way, but also um, it, it was like obviously a soft spot in my heart because I know what it felt like to struggle. I know what it felt like to start a business and to really put your heart in it. There's companies that have great capital and those guys, although very passionate, don't really have that risk. Whereas these guys that are on the fourth floor of the SHOT Show or, or what we call the dungeon, <laughs> these guys are probably leveraging their mortgages and they're doing everything they can. And, uh, I really appreciate that. That's a, that's something that, you know, something instilled in me. I, I wanted to help them at the same time. I believe that they could help us. And we started getting a reputation for finding these companies that were up and coming and had incredible pro products, incredible people. I'm a, I'm a people person. And, um, the more I started to form these relationships with these companies, 
um, you know, the more they started to trust me. Um, I think my second or third year of SHOT Show, that's when people were going, okay, that guy's legit, right? He's, he's, he's nice at, at the very least. I've always tried to maintain a, a very honest and respectable approach to people. Um, you know, just been very clear. Um, you know, I, I, I pride myself on the fact that the type of person you meet is probably the same person you're going to know 10 years from now. So I, I'm not very good at keeping a facade. And I was just th that type of person. Um, you know, fast forward 12, 13 years, I'd probably worked with over 400 different brands and companies in many different capacities. Um, there's companies like Lantac. I remember finding where they all they had at that point was just a muzzle device. Um, and then they just really start to explode. We were sharing them on social media. We figured out the whole, you know, algorithm of, you know, cross promotion. And that was really the strength of, of Rainier Arms. We were, we were trying to find our, our, our image, our brand. Um, and that's what it became, you know, and is obviously John was a big part of that. And, but, you know, I really appreciated the fact that he, because of my enthusiasm, allowed me to just do it. Um, and so um, we started this little show called TriggerCon. Um, it all started in our parking lot where we just, it was kind of a, a, a grand opening, um, but it was so popular. Like we would have, you know, maybe a thousand, almost 2000 people come to this little parking lot out in Auburn, Washington, um, to the point where Auburn city was like, yo, you guys got to pull a permit or something because you got people crossing the street parking in businesses. And uh, we were like, well, well, maybe we'll do this again next year. Um, and when some of our partners that we had worked with heard that, they're like, well, we want to come out there and support you guys. Um, I think the second year we had like well over 20 something people that wanted to attend and quickly realized our venue space is not going to cut it. Um, then we started thinking a little bit bigger. Um, we rented the Tacoma Convention Center. Um, back then we called it uh, Northwest Shooting Sport Expo. Right. It was something very specific, you know, it was a shooting expo. Back then, I think we were just starting to crack the mold of like what we wanted to be as a as a show. Um, and then that's when I was like, well, why don't we just say consistent with the character of what we've built at Rainier Arms, which is um, high end innovation uh, products. So we started working with some of the top, you know, manufacturers of the show. Um, and it was it was it was very slow at first. Right. Yeah, uh, I think we our first official show was like 60 some odd people and you know although it looked great on paper when we saw it lay out we're like oh there's a lot of empty spaces <laughs> you know how do we deal with this how do we get the experience to our end users or customers that are unable to attend shot show you know give them that sort of glimpse of what a convention show looks like and back then you know there's not a single show you know that catered to the northwest or even within that timeline. And that's when I said, this is our identity. This is how we're going to do it. And uh, every year we continue to grow it. We implemented different um, aspects of the show, like the VIP party. Um, and then we started working with groups like the PTSD Foundation. Um, so a little background about me. I come from a, a very military family. All of my brothers, I'm very proud of, um, all went to the military. I Because I didn't, complete high school. I didn't qualify for that. That was instantly one of the things I wanted to do, but I couldn't. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of them have served and even my older brother still is a police officer for Island County. Um, and so, you know, that was always like a very soft spot for me. And I always found that the most rewarding part of the job is to give back to that community. And I almost felt selfish doing it because it almost, it was something that Mostly, you know, what I really wanted to do, but I, I felt like would be good for our companies to be a part of. And so we started working with, you know, different organizations on, you know, giving back to that community. And, I, you know, it was the fulfilling part of my, of my, you know, position and role we raised. We, we did a great job of raising a lot of money for different organizations. Um, but anyhow, so that was uh, another segment of, of the Rainy Arms journey, uh, if you if you will, um, you know, spent 12, 13 years there, um, and I was approached by a company called Aero Precision. Um, so I was I came on board as their 
uh, strategic or director of strategy. You know, basically kind of working on programs, working on some of the e-commerce stuff, um, and spent a little bit of time there, um, and then was laid off. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was a very tough year for me. Um, obviously, I'd lost my mother uh, only a few weeks before that. And in fact, I was actually going on vacation uh, to spread her ashes, and I was given the unfortunate news. Um, and that was, you know, very difficult. And But something inside was like, son, you're going to be all right. Um, and at, when I came back from vacation, I had several offers. And uh, one of the offers came from a gentleman named Nate Treadaway. Um, and he had recently acquired uh, primary weapons. By recently, I, I think he, they had owned it for about a year and a half or maybe two years. Um, and that's where I am today. Um, I am the senior director of marketing for their several brands, uh, which is Lone Wolf and Primary Weapons. We also got another brand called Bullet Vault uh, that we're starting up, and we've got other projects on its way. So um, I think everything that I had gone through through the my my uh, pathway or my career um, in the industry had had certainly prepared me for it. You know, I, I got a good understanding of of how to buy things, how to sell things, um, on that side of fence, as well as, you know, helping uh, run the marketing of probably one of the largest AR manufacturers in the country. So it was, it was, it was, although it was a little bitter at the same time, I, 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 I definitely thank them for that opportunity because it wasn't, I always found the things that maybe are the most challenging or the most like, man, that's very defeating are oftentimes the things that build you up. Um, I don't think, you know, you're at, during the time it happens, you're often very ignorant of it. And um, now I realize it was a blessing, um, you know, and this I'm in a great position now uh, with some really good people. And I'm really excited to, um, you know, really do some things that I had learned. And it's a very kind of a unique path in a, in a sense that um, but yeah, here I am now. Here you are now. <laughs> Ari, you know, first off. Thank you for sharing that story. That's an amazing, inspirational story. Um, I've known your name for almost seven years. Yeah. Um, you know, we, I used to work at Faxon. You used to work with my good friend, Kurt, and yeah. our, our Alex Broski, who was previously on this podcast. Um, I would say that you are the godfather of cross promotion. I mean, you you have innovated that segment of the industry because nobody was doing it at the time. You really went out there and found these companies, and I applaud you for finding the companies in the dungeon or basement of of Shot Show. Um, for people who may know, Shot Show is has grown traumatic, you know, really big over the last two, three years yeah. with the opening of the Caesars Forum. But the basement is really where people really got their start because yeah. you couldn't get on the main floor. And yep. to find those small companies and boost them up, I, I applaud you for doing that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it was it was very natural to me. I felt I, I didn't sympathize for them because I know that, you know, they were out there doing their best. But those are guys that are using their mortgages. They're using their, their savings. And, you know, I, I wanted to work with them because I knew that they were, you know, hungry. They wanted to get out there. They don't have huge capital to fall back on. If this doesn't work, like for many of them, it's like, what do you do? Right. So um, I came from a small outfit. They're, they're a small outfit. And I, I love the scrappiness of that business owner, especially when they're bringing to market these products that probably are not going to get picked up by most, you know, retailers or whatever. Um, you know, uh, but not to say that they weren't incredible products, um, but I always kind of had a little bit of an eye for that and knew, hey, I think that the, this company is going to go somewhere because they they have great people. You know, that, that, that's to me, you know, that the big part of my job was like um, reading people. Um, you know, uh, there's times and that's that's what I learned, you know, growing up, you know, uh, work in the business um, you know, and and yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, everyone who has kind of understood business or been around business their whole life kind of understands 
that there's three main categories for success, people, product, and process. Mm -hmm. If your people are right and your product is great and Mm -hmm. you have a good process to bring it to market, you're going to succeed if given that opportunity. So it's, it's great to see people who took a chance and made something fantastic because you know, that's where innovation lies. That's where the growth in the second amendment lies is mm-hmm. by innovating and making things more accessible to yes. people and um, adding competition to the market is so vital long-term um, to the overall community because if there was no competition, then the prices would go unchecked and, yes. and you would unfortunately would leave a lot of people without the means to maybe even get their first firearm to begin with. That's right. And I, I think that's where I, I started to build a better relationship because, you know, it was that loyalty that I had to them where, you know, many of these businesses, when they only had a single product, now become these much bigger entities and they remember, you know, that that hand up that we had. And they're, they've been grateful and loyal and they've, you know, those are those are guys I, I really consider, you know, good friends. Um, you know, even when my mother passed away, a lot of them called my phone personally and they would send flowers like they really cared. And so um, I'm, I'm always grateful for the fact that, and I, you know, I always tell people like what I do, I, you know, if I do some good for somebody, that transaction ends right there, meaning I don't expect anything back. Um, if you want to give back to me, great. But I always felt good just serving others I, I i i realized you know in my path that because i was i was so persistent because i was trying to serve my mom i was trying to serve other people and somehow some way this universe found a way to like you know reward me and 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 so you know one of the questions i remember nate asked me was like what what, what gets you up? actually it was jason kearns he's like what gets you up in the morning I so I think of the people I love. I think of the people I serve and I, I lose myself in that service. And, uh, somehow, some way, um, things work out for me and, uh, I can't explain it. You, you, you know, you could say it's my faith. Um, but you know, I, when I don't think about myself and I think about what I can do for other people, it just comes back. So I think that's, that's a big part of why I think people, um, like me and, have that respect for me. Um, I've it's been my story since I started in this industry, and it's still my story now. Um, so, as you have seen, so many companies start from ground zero. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge administratively in that startup phase for gun companies? It's it's, it's you know as you know. Um, starting a business is very difficult, but starting a firearms business is even more difficult because, you know, the States, they're, they're pretty ruthless. They, they'll tax you to, you know, to the point where it makes it very difficult to turn a profit. Um, certain commerce, um, certain, uh, payment processing, um, places, uh, once they find out that you're, um, you know, firearms related, we'll, we'll, we'll drop you. Um, we don't have... Um, access to conventional means of marketing, um, like say a soda company or a clothing company has, um, they do. They make it very difficult for business. So it, we really had to use the power of our community, the power of social media, to find these like-minded individuals in order to get our products out in front of people. Um, they obviously have cracked down on that with these algorithms and have made it even more difficult. So that's why it was even more important to have events, shows, giving people access to see, converse with these companies, because we didn't have that opportunity to have commercials or to uh, uh, do anything uh, traditionally from a marketing standpoint. It's the most difficult thing um, from a business standpoint to do. So that's a, that's the biggest hurdle. Um, second, most companies are not going to, or banks are not going to want to lend to what they consider dangerous, you know, um, products. Um, oftentimes you, you were blacklisted. So getting capital, getting loans are, are often the biggest barriers for some of these businesses. Um, it, it, you can't pay machines with love and likes. 
Um, you you have to have hard cash and capital, um, and then you got to ca- continue to keep it growing. Um, so that in itself, its inability to properly market products to its consumers, um, you know, companies, uh, payment centers that you know are don't want to work with you, um, you know, even websites. I remember um, watching you know companies go down left and right uh, when they realized they were selling goods on their e-commerce platforms. You know, there's a lot of people that lost their website, a lot of people that would lose their channels on their on their Facebook and it would just kill their momentum. So, you know, we try to bridge that gap by social media, by events, by getting to where our customers are. So uh, I love the trend now of and I, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, we, we semi started that with the church con effect. Now you got gun con, you got can con, you got, you know, all these other events and I. It honestly, um, you know, puts a puts a big smile on my heart. Um, I, 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 I hope more people do it because, um, you know, it's very difficult for us to get our voice out there. Um, you know, so the more people that see that, the more people um, are able to attend these events that don't have an FFL so they can't go to SHOT Show, the better um, because they're bringing their families, they bring their friends, they make a day out of it, um, you know. Part of the aspect of TriggerCon that we try to do was um, make it inclusive to all family members. So, you know, one of the one year at TriggerCon, I had um, this uh, shooting, um, this virtual shooting um, event. I got six hours to sponsor me, and they gave out pistols and optics to winners that played this, you know, virtual game. Um, I had a very good friend um, that helped develop this game. Um, he was also a fellow shooter. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just, it, I think that's what, where we started to get that momentum um, a little bit. Um, it, it was very difficult to, to, to host if, um, these type of events at certain cities. So um, I would meet with the city council of Bellevue and just try to beg and, and convince them that, hey, we're not who you maybe think we are. Uh, we're not just you know, mouth breeding, knuckle dragging, and, and, and tell you what, when we first hosted our, our show in Bellevue, we, we hosted at the Maiden Bower, Maiden Bower Center. And for those who are not familiar with the area, um, this was in a very ritzy part of town. Uh, Microsoft was right down the street. You had Gucci right around the corner, Mont Blanc, um, just a very posh uh, area. Um, but the response that I got from Maiden Bower Center um, you know, uh, the people that were allowing us to host there was you guys had some of the most well-mannered, you know, best type of consumers coming through there. There was zero issues. And it's like, yeah, that, you know, that we're normal folks, you know, we're, 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 you know, it's not what you think we are. We're just dragging our AKs around. No, you got doctors, lawyers, you got, you know, father, fathers, mothers, sisters, like it's, you, you would not be able to differentiate, um, from the streets. And so it was great. That was, to me was like a, a win, um, to, to demonstrate to that city of Bellevue that, Hey, you know, we're, we're, we're regular responsible Americans, um, just out there with this, um, you know, want and need to control our, you know, security for our family. Um, Because that's another thing growing up that I was taught very early on was being accountable for your own safety. Don't rely on others. Don't rely on police or whatever, right? Um, You have to be responsible for your your own self. And the more that we are able to demonstrate that to the society, to the communities, um, the better, you know. In fact, uh, another story I want to share is, um, you know, my my children um, are are both very um, involved in dance and gymnastics. Um, and as a father, like I, I always wanted to, to be there. I was a gym dad. Uh, in fact, I was a, the, the, their vice president for their booster club. Um, and you know, I, I don't, don't believe in hiding anything that you're not ashamed of. Like you shouldn't have to. Um, so although I wasn't always like walking around with a gun shirt on, eventually some of the parents and even some of the coaches found out my industry. Uh, I, I, I work in the firearms space. Um, and even then it just seemed weird and taboo because they would come over to me as if they were like buying drugs, you know, they would whisper, so I hear you're, you're selling guns. And I was like, yes, 
why are we whispering? <laughs> <laughs> And in, in, in fact, so I, I had met with many different parents, and in fact, they were all concerned for their safety, but they were vastly ignorant to how to purchase a gun, how to how to shoot a gun. So I volunteered myself. I said, you come to my shop. I'm going to sell you a gun that's going to fit your needs, and we're going to go to the range and shoot it. Um, I started taking parents out there, um, and next thing you know, the coaches were like, hey, you know, would you help me out? I was like, absolutely. Um, I took two coaches out, sold them guns through Rainier Arms, and then t brought them out to the range. And they're like, you think we should bring the kids? I was like, absolutely. And so the kids got out there and they, they you know, I would bring my little 22 buck mark with a suppressor and a red dot, um, simply because I, I wanted to instill with them proper mechanics of how to shoot, um, you know, and it, my heart was full, right? Um, at that point, you know, people realize, hey, um, they they learned at first who, who I was as a father. I was a very caring and involved father. And look at me. I also sell guns and, and advocate for firearm safety. Yeah. Uh, well, it's advocating for the entire Second Amendment community. And I think that we often forget that activism starts at home. Yes. And it's not if you're waiting for you know, someone on the internet to change someone's mind, you're going to be waiting a really long time. That's right. Um, and so it's so important that we as individuals take that personal responsibility mm -hmm. and educate the people around us and, and allow ourselves to be opening and open and inviting um, and, and let them ask questions mm -hmm. and, and bring them into the community and, and into the fold. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that, that's absolutely. I think all of us has a has that responsibility to demonstrate and be good ambassadors for for shooting sports and and be open to have those type of conversations um, with the people that are surround us. I think uh, oftentimes people really want to find a way to make a big splash and, and get out to as many people. But I I advocate I, let's start with our, our own communities and friends. Let's start with the people that you converse with, your school, your your, your community, what, whatever, you know, things that your children are involved in, you know, if you, if everyone just took the time to just take care of their own, you know, surroundings and their communities, I think we would all have a really good start for educating these type of people. And I, you know, I, I, I don't blame necessarily blame them. I, I blame, you know, media and, and, and some of the things that they try to paint pictures of, of who we are, which is very false. You know, it, people were very shocked at first that I sold guns. They're like, you, you seem like such a nice guy. Yeah. I was like, what do you expect? You know, like I was going to go out and start, you know, spitting guns out on my fingers. <laughs> like, no, I love my children. I believe in God. I believe in service of our country. I believe in all these things. And and guess what? I'm also I also believe in firearms. And if you're willing um, to open your mind, if you're willing to take some time, I will make time to be there. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a saying that says that uh, talking heads are only good for instilling fear, not instilling trust. Yeah, that's a good and, one. And um, I think that we find that in society a lot where um, there's a fear of firearms and, and no one is out there um, saying, wait, what, well, why, why is it that the government is the only one that's supposed to be able to have this. And, mm -hmm. and when you start asking questions, it's amazing how quickly um, that unravels. Yeah, very true, very true. But until they start to really see where the rubber meets the road and see that, hey, this is only as dangerous as your mentality or your ability allows, um, then they start asking those questions. Um, it, 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 because until then, they, they believe, I don't need that. It, that's that 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 would associate with associate me with a bad person, whereas you know I grew up in a family where our our my brother served using those dangerous weapons that everyone wants to you know um, villainize. So I think there's a hundred. We could do a hundred more podcasts with you. You have such a great, fantastic story. And you really show the human side of this industry, which is normally we are vilified by everybody. Um, and I applaud you for sharing that story. Um, we're going to wrap this up. Go ahead and plug anything you want to plug, sure. socials, websites for everything. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
most definitely um, make sure you uh, check us out at uh, primaryweapons.com. That's www.primaryweapons.com, as well as Lone Wolf Arms. Um, so uh, we, we've got, you know, all of our social media channels. Like I said, it's very difficult to get content out because of algorithm. So make sure you come to our channels and uh, like, comment, subscribe, just like anything else because that you know everything is working against us and we got to stick together yeah so like i already just said make sure to like comment and subscribe hit the little bell for notification on youtube leave a five-star review on all the podcasting hosts and have a great rest of your day